you're listening to This Is My Story. I'm Ruth O'Reilly Smith. This show is all about sharing stories of how God's amazing love has changed lives forever. Today's episode is with Claudio Corquet, a former drug trafficker who, after an encounter with God, escaped from a life of organized crime and drug abuse. His story begins in Argentina. In 76, when there was a military coup in, in Argentina, there was much violence and uh, the guerrillas, it was very unsafe to live in, in the big city that I grew up. So one day I decided just to uh, flee the country for the sake of saving my life in a way. And I thought of, of America. It was very popular in those days in my native Argentina. So I ended up in Washington, D.C., the capital. I lived there and worked there for uh, about three years or so. And then I went to the Big Apple. When I moved to New York, I, I used to work in a, a very exclusive uh, clothing store, Italian clothing store for men in, in the very heart of Manhattan, very expensive. And some of our clients were from the Colombian Mafia. So, you know, they travel with other things in their suitcases. <laughs> they try not to carry much clothes. So every time they came to the city, they, the first thing they did is come to our shop to, you know, get decent clothes. At the end of the day, they will send the limo to pick us up, the, the owner and, and myself, and, and we will be driven, you know, to the Plaza Hotel and just party there in the top floor, champagne, women, and all sorts of wrong things, and then going clubbing until the early hours of the morning. When my friends, the actual drug dealers, uh, left the city, if they had any leftover merchandise, because they trusted me, they would leave it with me. And sometimes one, two, three, four kilos of pure cocaine, you know, big amounts, wow. big money. Until one day, the stupid idea crossed my mind of actually, you know, doing business with it. This stupid idea soon became extremely profitable, and Claudio found himself trafficking cocaine around the United States. I stopped working at the shop because it didn't pay, so uh, I had loads of money. I had, you know, flats here and there. I had a flat in, in, in Washington, D.C. I had another flat in, in the state of Virginia by the beach. I used to travel to Miami for business all the time and to Hollywood. Uh, we had clients there. Going to the best clubs in New York, uh, just having drinks with the most famous people, you know, of the world, the Rolling Stones, American actors from Hollywood. So my life was, you know, I, I never knew what, what tomorrow would be like. A uh, type of life that everybody strangely seems to admire. You know, I have friends in Miami that would pick me up from the airport in their uh, Ferraris. And, and uh, uh, when we have free time waiting for the shipment to arrive, we used to race races with some of my friends with a speedboat. And I, would, I, I had a big Mercedes in those days, very powerful. So we would race from Fort Lauderdale to Miami for it to see who got there first. And... The, win, the, the loser will pay dinner, whatever, you know. Yeah. Stupid things, driving a f sports car at over 100 miles an hour and, and not thinking what we were doing, high on drugs. In addition to trafficking large amounts of cocaine, Claudio's personal drug use was beginning to spiral out of control. At uh, one point, I started to... Uh, to smoke crack cocaine, which is highly addictive, highly, highly addictive. Spend three, four, five days without a sleep, with my mind going upside down, paranoid thoughts and, and all sorts of persecution, but still you cannot stop smoking stuff. You know, it's very, very addictive. Living a lifestyle such as this was always bound to end badly, and his actions had begun to put him on the radar of the authorities. The FBI discovered what I was doing, and they, uh, they had like 12 special agents assigned to my case. And they chased me for nine months. I didn't know. But because of my lifestyle, they, they never knew where I was going to be, you know, in the following hour. Because now I'm talking to you and, and in the next three hours I will catch a plane to Los Angeles or to Miami or back to New York or to Washington, you name it. So for nine months they chased me. And sure enough, Claudio's misdeeds finally caught up with him. 
I was in, in one of my flats in, in Washington, D.C., actually, and I, I was taking a shower, and uh, I suddenly hear this banging, you know, in the living room. I said, what in the world is that? So I very quickly left the shower just to find out, and it came from the front door. And I was all wet, you know, coming from the shower. And these 12 agents, they didn't know what to expect. They thought that it was a big, you know, mafioso type of guy, violent, aggressive, you know, full of arms and weapons and whatever. I didn't know that it was, you know, good old little me there, you know, inoffensive. <laughs> so the 12 agents were pointing at me with the shotguns, whatever they were. I don't know anything about weapons. So they pulled me against the wall and they searched me and I looked and I said, well, you know, <laughs> There's nothing to be found here. <laughs> I was wet and naked. After being arrested, Claudio pleaded guilty and soon found himself on trial, facing a lengthy prison sentence. What I've learned after a few weeks that the prosecution was asking for 49 years of imprisonment for my wrongdoings. So it was then that I thought to myself, I better tell my family that they will not be seeing me for a while. So I sent a letter to my mom, basically saying, Mom, you won't see me for a while. I, I got in trouble. I, I didn't want to trouble her much. Didn't go into detail, but I told her that, you know, what I was facing. So my family were Christians already for a few years, very few years. And uh, the church got together uh, one evening and, well, they just shared with the congregation that my family had, you know, a member of the family in, in Washington that was facing real trouble. And they together prayed for me, 150 people or so. And at the same time, my mother, as, as she replied the letter, advised me to, to pray as well. She, she said, if, if, if you think that there is no way out for you, why not pray to God for a miracle? So I thought, well, I have time. <laughs> So I, I simply said to God, Lord, if you set me free from this prison, I will serve you. The trial continued. I appeared before the, the judge and in court several times. On the last day of the trial came, I was asked to uh, stand you know, before the, the judge. I was so nervous, imagine. I was uh, 30 years of age, facing basically the rest of my life in prison. And the judge suddenly says this, I will never forget it. She says, I don't know why I'm doing this, he said, but I don't have anything against you. And I looked at him and I thought, what is this smoke? <laughs> you know, I had pleaded guilty of having sold pure cocaine to an FBI agent. I was set up. So the FBI agent was sitting there in court. I, I looked at him and his eyes were like saucers, you know. <laughs> what is wrong with the judge, you know? Although he didn't say it, his expression was that, mm -hmm. you know. And that's exactly my same impression, you know. What, what is going on here? He said, uh, I'm going to give you, instead of the 49 years, I'm going to give you three-year probation. If in these three years you go through a red light, I promise you I will give you the 49 years as the prosecution is asking, plus 49 years on my account. Get out of this court. I don't want to hear your name. I don't want to see your face again in my life. And I was so free. Free. And I was, I was standing there. And he was saying, go, leave. <laughs> and I, I, I was just petrified there, you know. Didn't understand the thing. After walking out of court a free man, Claudio's immediate focus was how he could get back to the lifestyle he had become so accustomed to. I went back to Argentina after that, straight away. The, uh, the government deported me, and the plan was to uh, contact some other mafia guys that I had contact with in, in Bolivia, right. and, and this time go back to America in a small aircraft full of trucks. But uh, I always say that the first time the FBI arrested me, but while in Argentina, uh, God arrested me as well. Mm. Claudio's family had become involved with a big crusade in Argentina with the evangelist Carlos Anacondia, who was at the forefront of a large revival that swept through South America in the mid-80s. Miracles were witnessed, churches were planted, and thousands of people gave their lives to the Lord during an incredible move of God. Claudio's brother engineered a meeting with the evangelist, Carlos, asking him to pray for Claudio. My brother asked me, would you pray for my brother? 
And as a matter of respect, you know, I bow my head and I say, okay, you know, it won't hurt. And it didn't. So he prayed and he blessed me. And in the process of the next three to five weeks, I started to attend church because I saw such a drastic change in the lifestyles and personality of my family. They were all day talking about an old black book, you know, about a spirit that was always present but no one could see, about someone that died on the cross 2,000 years ago when I was still alive, you know, and all those things, you know, for a boy like me with my type of uh, uh, mindsets at the time, it, it made no sense whatsoever. Despite not making sense to him, a curious Claudio continued to explore. So I said, okay, mom, give me a Bible. I want to see, you know, what's, what is wrong with that little book. You know, and I, and I started to read the book of Job. My mother tried to persuade me, no, you don't of need all, to read them. No. Of all <laughs> why, the books Why don't read. you read John and Luke, you know, <laughs> <laughs> nice gospel, understandable books. But, you know, God appealed to my, to my intellects because as, as a teenager... In Asia, I, I used to love the, the classic of poetry. I, I remember uh, at the age of 15, I think it was between 15 and 16, I, I read the, the whole work of Shakespeare in Spanish, but the whole work. I, and I loved Shakespeare and the Spanish classics. And therefore, you know, Job is a poetic book. Mm. And so God appealed to my intellect. And I really loved, you know, the style, the, the literary style of the book. Really, really, I fell in love with it. And at the same time, to see, you know, this, this Job man and his God and the relationship, you know, and all the, the, the conversations that they have, particularly towards the end of the book, you know, when God says, now you, you sit down and listen. You know, <laughs> I was fascinated, you know, mm. and I thought to myself, well, there's nothing wrong with this God, you know, I think he's, he's a cool guy. <laughs> so, uh, so I didn't find anything wrong in the Bible, as I said, you know, on the contrary. So I said, well... Take me to church. I, I, I want to see what type of brain uh, wash they do there. So we went to church, and I found wonderful people, very friendly, very kissy, and, you know, they're Latins, and, and huggy, and, and I got so many hugs in, in one hour <laughs> that I haven't had in the previous 20 years of my life. <laughs> However, I, I just thought that the people were great. Whatever was being said from the front was fantastic, you know, good, high value standards. So nothing wrong with church. So um, I kept attending church from time to time and uh, in a very slow and fast at the same time, period of time, the following six weeks or so, I ended up giving my life to the Lord. And the moment I did that, I was reminded by the Holy Spirit, little did I know back then, the words of, of the judge in that last audience, you know. That, of course, he didn't know what he was doing when he was setting me free because a miracle was taking place. How could he explain the miracle that God was using him against his will, against the, 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 the judiciary that he represented? You know, it was total nonsense. And I remember that, and, and, and following that, uh, God reminded me of my prayer that I was serving. So I said, Okay, here I am, Lord. So I got baptized, like the following baptismal service at, at the local church. On I think it was at the very end of June, and in the first week of July, I started to work full time at the local church. As this was in the middle of the ongoing revival, Claudio was immediately put to work assisting the church as they struggled to cope with the rising numbers of new Christians across Argentina. The numbers of people coming to faith were so overwhelmingly big. Hundreds and upon hundreds of people every night in the period of, of that, those nine initial months, or over 60,000 people came to faith. So churches started to be planted and, uh, and there weren't enough resources in, in, in any of, of the established churches to fully be able to embrace the, 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 the flow of people that the God was sending. So we, we've, we've had to had uh, at one point our local church have about 47 places in which the gospel was being preached in the middle of the week, from Monday to Friday. Because being Argentina, a Catholic country by tradition, 
everybody is a Catholic, no one goes to church. So the fact that they had accepted the Lord in an open door meeting didn't change much of the culture, although they grew more passionate for the things of God and very hungry. But it would never, it would never occur to them to go to church. So church had to go to them. So our pastor had this strategy, let's bring the church to where the people are. So whenever they held a crusade, they, they studied you know, demographically the neighborhood, uh, and if they had any believers there, they would be asked to open their houses to have midweek meetings for those who had accepted the laws. So at one point we had 47 of those. And me as a young believer, and worthy as I was, and trained as I was, uh, I was in charge of those 47 places. Not, not that I was preaching the gospel myself, I was totally incapable of doing that at the time. But logistically speaking, I was well able to do that. So uh, I, I, I provided you know, each one of those 47 places throughout the week with transport, microphones, tracts, Bibles, the order of the meeting, appoint a, a, a leader that, that would bring the gospel and, and get all the decision cards and then process them at the end of the meetings, etc., etc. It was quite, quite challenging. But it was, it was an amazing, an amazing thing. And the more amazing thing is, is that nowadays, as we are speaking, people have been saved there. Churches are being planted. This is absolutely incredible. On his journey, Claudio saw the power of God set him free from some addictions immediately, and still others required more willpower. Although the law set me free from my addiction, the moment that I stepped into prison back in Washington, my addiction to crack cocaine, which I had been smoking for the past five, six years, just went in one second. But he left quitting smoking cigarettes mm. to myself. Oh, it was horrendous. <laughs> so I was working at the church, you know, I was a Christian, baptized, a full-time worker, you know, <laughs> on staff, being paid by the church. And every hour and a half, I had to leave the office to smoke a cigarette, you know, and come back smelling like, you know. <laughs> and I felt embarrassed. I, yeah. I felt convicted, yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, it's not yeah. such a huge scene to smoke, you know, mm. maybe people in the audience that smoke, don't get me wrong, you know, I mean, <laughs> Jesus loves you anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Stop doing it, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and you may feel unworthy, perhaps, of, of for, your, for your habits. You may smoke, you may drink, you may be into porn, even into drugs. Uh, and, and, and you think to yourself, well, but who am I to be considered by God? Who am I to deserve to be worthy of, of a blessing from God to set, that would set me free from my addiction, from my bondage? Well, you are no different to what I was. And not only that he set me free from my addictions, but he set me free from a 49-year-long sentence in prison. So I, I, I want to give you hope, and I would like to very briefly pray for you in the name of Jesus, that the bondages may be broken over your life in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I set you free by the blood of the Lamb, by the power of the cross. Be free in Jesus' name. Amen. been listening to This Is My Story with Claudio Coquette. For more information on any of the issues raised in this episode, please see the show notes. Make sure you share and subscribe and to hear more podcasts from UCB, you can download the UCB Player app or search UCB wherever you get your podcasts. UCB.co.uk 